A 13-year-old little girl seemingly vanishes into thin air. Her birthday was February 22, and she had said in the past, when I turn 13, I want to go away from everybody and go live alone in the woods. And right now, I think I know why. Is this little girl still alive? Where is Maddie? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. Right off the top, there is a very strong chance Maddie could still be alive. Tip line 407-254-7000. Repeat, 407-254-7000. Every minute counts with what we are dealing with right now. Her mother devastated, and in the last hours, around 10 p.m. last night, a break in the case, but still no Maddie. First of all, take a listen to Sheriff John Mina, Orange County. This is every parent's worst nightmare. Uh, many of our detectives and deputies who are working the case, uh, they also have children, um, so they're working extra hard to find Madeline. We can't even imagine uh, the pain and anguish that Madeline's family is going through. So, but I do want to assure the community that we have well over uh, 100 deputies, detectives, uh, intelligence analysts, and specialized personnel who are investigating this case and searching for Madeline uh, right now. And we will not stop until we find her. Over 100 deputies, detectives, intelligence analysts, specialized personnel, that means dog handlers, drones, you name it, in the search for Madeline Soto. Where is this girl? None of it makes any sense. With me, an all-star panel. But first, I want to go out to Hannah McKenzie, joining us out of Orlando, investigative reporter, Fox 35. Hannah McKenzie, thank you for being with us. Hannah, tell me about the morning that Maddie disappeared. Okay, um, so Maddie was last seen around 8.30 a.m. on Monday, February 26th. She was dropped off outside of, about a block away from her middle school, which was Hunter's Creek Middle School. But she never actually made it into the school. School officials confirm she never checked in. None of her classes wasn't there the entire day. Her family thought that she was there, but it wasn't until her mother went to pick her up around 4.30 p.m. that they realized Maddie hadn't been there. You know, before I began screaming at the top of my lungs about why the school didn't call the parents, why nobody knew how whoever has her, if somebody has her, got what, an eight or nine hour jump on us, um, explain to me. You're joining us from Orlando. Where exactly did this happen? So this is within the Orange County School District, and it's the Orange County area. Um, I've spoken with um, a number of Maddie's uh, relatives, including two of her aunts, her grandmother, and her mother, all of whom, like you, are so puzzled and confused as to why there wasn't a call from the school district letting them know that Maddie wasn't there. Apparently, and this is coming from the family, the school district's protocol is to release a robocall around 4.30 or 5 p.m., letting parents know that their student wasn't in class that day. But like you said, that gives an eight, nine-hour jump on any nefarious activity that could have gone wrong. By then, it's too late. You need to know where your child is immediately. Nothing but a robocall. No text no email. So unless you're at home, basically, to get that call, you don't have any idea. Guys, we are talking about a little 13-year-old girl. We are talking about Madeline Soto, just 13. She goes as Maddie. Guys, you were hearing earlier Sheriff John Mina with the Orange County Sheriff's. Now, take a listen to the sheriff. Mom's boyfriend dropped uh, Madeline off at about 8.30 a.m. on Monday morning, a few blocks away from the school. At approximately 4.30 on Monday afternoon, Madeline's mom went to the school to pick her up and found out that Madeline was not there and had never um, 
reported to school, so she never actually entered uh, the school. <clears throat> and so we also learned that uh, Madeline left her phone at home that day. Okay, I find so many things about what I'm just hearing to be very curious. You're hearing Sheriff John Minna from the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Number one, when I drop my children at school, I take them to the door as best as I can. Um, I don't drop them several blocks away, number one. Uh, number two, she left her phone at home. Uh, you know, Hannah McKenzie, does she go to a school where they don't allow phones in school? I don't believe that to be the case, but Jen Soto, Maddie's mother, did tell me it was very regular that Maddie forgot her phone. And keep in mind, this is only a few days after turning 13. So really, she's still a 12-year-old. Um, they're not the most responsible. And yes, I'm sure parents are constantly you know, reminding the kids, don't forget this, keep this, put this in your backpack. But Jen Soto tells me that Maddie would leave her phone behind quite often. So that wasn't abnormal. That may be true, but uh, let me go out to Anna Sonoda joining us, child grooming expert, clinical social worker, author of Duck, Duck, Groom, Understanding How a Child Becomes a Target. Just those words right there, how a child becomes a target are very disturbing. On many many levels but Anna Sonoda <laughs> I, I, I don't know just based on every teen or preteen that I know they go nowhere without a phone and I find it very coincidental that this day of all days she goes to school without a phone yeah that's a really curious detail Nancy and I would also be curious about whether or not the boyfriend consistently dropped her off at other locations besides the front door of the school. Is this a common occurrence or is this something out of the ordinary? We are trying to determine exactly what happened in the morning hours when little Maddie Soto gets dropped off at her school. Uh, everyone, this occurred in Orlando, Florida. Um, it's beautiful, sunny, warm, so I'm guessing if she were out in the woods, Hannah McKenzie, she would not be subjected to any kind of weather that would cause hypothermia. But I, I just haven't had very good experiences in my world of children fending for themselves in the woods. So what were the temps on the 26th? So right now in Orlando, it has been beautiful weather. It's been kind of cool for us. Um, 70s and then at night around 60s. Um, it, it has been beautiful weather, so yeah, no chance of hypothermia um, for sure. At least that's one thing we don't have to worry about. For those of mm -hmm. you just joining us, a beautiful little girl, Madeline Soto, missing since Feb 26. She was dropped off to school by mom's boyfriend. The mom has been in a long-term relationship with the boyfriend. He knows the daughter. When mom came to pick her up, she had never come into the school. What more do we know? Listen to Sheriff John Minna. We were called uh, on Monday evening at approximately 8 p.m. Our patrol deputies went out there, met with Madeline's mom at the school um, near Hunters Creek uh, to take a report on, on her missing daughter. So. Uh, we started the investigation uh, that night, uh, started canvassing the area, looking for any witnesses uh, or surveillance video. So later that evening, uh, while we were doing investigation, we did obtain um, an article of Madeline from the house. We called our bloodhound. The bloodhound did uh, an extensive search, which unfortunately did not provide any results uh, about her whereabouts. Mm -mm. Uh, joining me right now, Chris McDonough, former homicide detective with over 300 death investigations under his belt. 
He's the founder of the Cold Case Foundation, and he is the star of The Interview Room on YouTube. Chris McDonough, thank you for being with us. Okay, let, let, let me understand something. And anybody on the panel, we've got a lot of esteemed guests on with us. This is not high tea at Windsor Castle. Jump in if you got an idea. But Chris McDonough, question to you. So she's last seen at 8.30 a.m. in the morning when the boyfriend of the mom, mom's boyfriend, drops her off. There is actually surveillance video of her out of the vehicle sitting in a parking lot. I believe Hannah McKenzie wasn't at a nearby church. That is correct. It's grainy video apparently, but it shows Maddie. We don't know if she was alone or with anyone else, but that video shows that she was dropped off in the area. Where is the church in relation to the school? When I grew up, the school, Dr. John H. Hurd Elementary, was in the very same parking lot. We shared a parking lot with Liberty United Methodist Church. So if somebody said, oh, you're in the church parking lot, that meant you're in the school parking lot. It was the same thing. So I'm trying to understand, where is this church where she's sitting in the parking lot in the morning? It's about a block away. Uh, if you're standing on the sidewalk and kind of crane your neck, you would still be able to see the signage for the school. Okay, that's important. Uh, guys, Hannah McKenzie joining us, Fox 35, one block away, and the boyfriend said he dropped her off a couple of blocks or a block away from the school. He says he was ashamed of his vehicle. Did you guys see that? hear that? She was ashamed of the vehicle. Okay, well, can I tell you something? My twins hate to get dropped off by me and my minivan. Hate it. Now, is that the case? I don't know. But he says he dropped her off a couple of blocks away. She's seen in the church parking lot, which Hannah McKenzie is telling me is one block away on surveillance video. We know she got out of his vehicle. That's important. So back to you, Chris McDonough. Here is another conundrum. The police get a call, the sheriff's, uh, Sheriff John Mena, Orange County Sheriff, says he gets a call at 8 p.m. Excuse me, is it pick up 3, 3.30? What, what happened between 3 and 8? It's five more hours. Help me, Chris McDonough. Yeah, red flags here. Uh, if the child has that type of gap in between from the moment they were seen on that CCTV potentially, and the moment that they should have been returned home, uh, that time obviously works in favor of the suspect, whoever that person is at this point. And that's going to be, you know, quite uh, difficult to fill in that time until they get somebody into custody. Um, back to you, Hannah McKenzie, Fox 35. Why the delay? Uh, it, maybe it's completely innocent. And let me stress, I do not believe Maddie's mother is involved in her disappearance in any way at all. Um, but that, that time period, that's, that's disturbing. Now, if I can't find one of the twins, which let me think has never happened. Hold on just a moment. Just once when John David snuck off at age three inside a baby superstore. But when they're not where I think that they're supposed to be, I take time to call them to look for them. Maybe mom called her cell phone for 30 minutes. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Text it, text it, text it. Maybe mommy didn't know that the phone had been left at home. Maybe mommy drove the route and checked the route between the school and home and started calling friends. But five hours is a long time to wait to call police, Hannah McKenzie. Do you know what was happening in that five hours? So, Nancy, it's funny you, you mentioned that. We are getting kind of conflicting reports. Obviously, we've requested um, the call logs. But right now, Jen Soto, Maddie's mom, tells me she went to the school to pick her up around 4.30, realized she wasn't there. She did exactly what you just said, Nancy. She drove a route that was from the school to Maddie's grandmother's business, which was very close, probably within a mile. Well, whose business? She, whose business? This is Maddie's um, grandmother, so Jen's mom. Okay. So she drove that route to see if Maddie maybe had walked to her grandmother's business. Didn't see her. Went back to the school. By the time she got back to the school, it was closed. She emailed Maddie's teachers, got confirmation that Maddie didn't make it to school that day. 
she tells me she called police immediately and they told her they didn't have deputies to send her away and to hold tight. Multiple members of Maddie's family tell me they just began calling 911, trying to get an officer out there to, to take a report, but they felt they were being put on the back burner. It wasn't until around eight o'clock they were finally able to get in contact with a deputy to make the report. You know what it sounds like to me, Hannah McKenzie? That a lot of people have it all bass backwards. The mom, the time is reduced if the mom went at 4.30 and the call was at 8. Um, okay, let me go back to Chris McDonough. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan, who's, who's speaking? That's Chris. Chris, jump in. Okay, so also another thing to consider, to your point just a minute ago, is, you know, she's dressed for a day activity, i.e. black shorts, a green hoodie, and white Crocs. She's not dressed as if she's, you know, in long pants and is going to stay out into the evening, which you had talked about earlier. So this child is anticipating, you know, some type of activities during the day, uh, which is obviously important to consider uh, from an investigative perspective. Um, guys, you're hearing Chris McDonough from the interview room on YouTube. Uh, now, um, I'm trying to figure out where you head next in this investigation. We also hear Hannah McKenzie, Fox 35, that bloodhounds were called out. Where? That's correct. Bloodhounds were called out near the school. Apparently, like, there's a little hiking area back there. Um, they brought in an article of Maddie's clothing for a scent reference and bloodhounds were brought in. Um, unfortunately, they didn't hit on any scent trails. Even in the church parking lot? I believe so. They were canvassing the entire area where Maddie had been seen. I know multiple businesses had surveillance video showing her, according to what Sheriff Mina was saying. Um, so they did scour that area, and I believe they're still out there today. Multiple businesses catch Maddie on cam? Yes, no. In addition, yes, in addition to the original grainy video from the church, uh, Sheriff Mina mentioned in his press conference that there was other video showing Maddie. Guys, uh, joining me right now, I'm hearing in my ear, Dr. Trace Sargent, search rescue recovery expert, and spent a great deal. This is how I met her. She's an expert canine handler. She's a star of a podcast, The Seeker's Quest. And you can find her on Facebook at The Seekers Quest. Trace, thank you so much for being with us. I know you from your days as an expert dog handler. What does this tell you about the bloodhounds being brought out? Well, Nancy, it's interesting listening to the timeline here. That is an important factor when we look at all these different resources, specifically for dogs. Dogs have this incredible, amazing ability to detect scent in a lot of different ways. However, it's important for listeners to know that scent, if you look at it from the perspective of a living organism, it comes to life, it has a life cycle, and then it dies out. And there are many factors that can either accelerate or decelerate that lifespan of scent. Describing the scene of where Maddie was last seen, it was very uh, urban, concrete, asphalt, a lot of vehicles. Even though it wasn't super, super hot, it was still sunny uh, type of weather. It wasn't raining. It was dry conditions. All of those factors is going to have a negative effect on scent. And the bottom line is this. No matter how good a dog is, if scent isn't there, they're not going to detect it because there isn't any scent there. If we don't pick up scent in an area, and it's really very fortunate that we have any video uh, surveillance that shows that Maddie was in the area. So that is a big, big plus that we as dog handlers have what we call a starting point. Uh, and then the dogs can determine a direction of travel, pick up the scent, and then follow that person's scent to hopefully where they are. In this case, if the dogs are not able to pick it up, you have to say, okay, did Maddie get into a vehicle with someone? Or I'm going, if I was working this, I would put my dog in a situation where if Maddie is in the area and we can't see her with our eyes, I'm going to use my dog for that. Let's say in a wooded area 
or in a, uh, maybe hidden in a building or something like that where we visually can't see her. Also, if I put the dogs, let's say, in a wooded area, there's a higher likelihood that scent is going to be more contained there because of the vegetation, the grass, the trees, the canopy of the vegetation and trees. All of those factors are going to help scent stay alive even after hours or days later. So just because the dog team doesn't find scent at that exact location, there are still alternatives to use that resource, but it also raises other questions. Is Maddie not in the area? Has she been picked up? Is she, uh, is, because my thought is that if she's in the area and let's say she's fallen down and hurt, uh, her scent is absolutely going to be quite strong in what we call a scent pool. So if we're looking here now four or five days later, she's lying there in the woods, her scent pool is going to be extremely strong for, for the dogs to detect and be able to go to her. This makes me think that she has been taken somewhere in a vehicle. Uh, guys, we are learning more about the investigation. Has little 13-year-old Madeline Soto been taken away in a vehicle? Is she still alive? The facts we are learning are very disturbing. Very disturbing. Listen to Sheriff Minna. Our missing persons uh, detectives responded to take over the investigation. So they did uh, interviews with mom, mom's boyfriend, Madeline's friends uh, from school. Uh, we were able to access Madeline's phone, and there is information on the phone uh, that indicated that she told people when she turned 13, which was on February 22nd, she actually wanted to go live in the woods. Uh, so that was in her phone. And I think I know why this little girl wanted to go live in the woods. Listen. Detectives forensically examined Stephen Stern's cell phone and discovered disturbing images. Looking into the phone's data, detectives uncovered attempts to delete evidence from the device as well. Images and videos on Stephen Stern's phone that were criminal and sexual in nature Detectives were then able to determine that those crimes were committed at the family home in Kissimmee. Kissimmee police were notified immediately. Stephen Stearns was brought into the Orange County Central Operations Office to be interviewed, but he invoked his right to an attorney. Sheriff John Mina says the search for Madeline continues. Straight back out to Hannah McKenzie joining us. Investigative reporter of Fox 35 in Orlando. Let me understand. Detectives not only look at Maddie's phone. They looked at the mom's boyfriend phone, Stephen Stearns. There they discover what they say are disturbing images. They also see where there have been attempts to delete images. The detectives state that the images show crimes were committed in the family home and they are now investigating mom's boyfriend for sexual battery. What can you tell me? Well, disturbing developments for sure there, Nancy. Not only are they investigating the boyfriend, Stephon Stearns, they have arrested him. He is charged with sexual battery and possession of child sexual abuse material. I spoke with Maddie's family. They were in tears just following this news. Um, telling me it's disturbing um, that he's been by Maddie's mom's side, Jennifer. He's been by her side throughout this entire process, and they're very shocked to hear the news. Possession of child sex abuse material. He is charged with sex battery. Uh, Hannah, in the charge against him, who is the alleged victim? They actually haven't named victim. They just have said that he is now prime suspect in the disappearance of Maddie Soto. Jarrett Ferentino joining me, homicide prosecutor, uh, high profile lawyer at JarrettFerentino.com, host of True Crime Boss. Jarrett, I think I know why she wanted to go live in the woods. I mean, if these crimes, according to what we are learning, they are telling us, we're not fabricating this, that the sex crimes, the sex battery, 
and the child sex abuse material, the crimes were committed at the family home. Maddie is a child in the family home. Now she's gone. She's been saying she wants to go live in the woods. A red flag, my rear end. If your little girl says, I want to just go live in the woods, mom, I want to know why do you want to go live in the woods? Why don't you want to stay in the home with me and your dad and your brother? I mean, it's screaming at me, Jarrett Ferentino, that she is the likely victim of child molestation. Clearly, Nancy, she's trying to distance herself from that home, and one can only conclude that it's distancing herself from the individuals in that home. Uh, the charge of sexual battery really jumps out, and the fact that the police are saying the location of the crime was in the home. Um, those are not typically the charges that coincide with possession of child abuse materials. These are actual batteries and affirmative acts that appear to have happened in the home. One can only conclude that Maddie would have been the victim of those. Uh, late last night, this boyfriend was taken into custody. Uh, you can see him wearing a white mm, jumpsuit. That's clearly county issue. Hannah McKenzie, what can you tell me? Hannah joining us from Fox 35 Orlando. What time did this go down? And are the only two charges right now child abuse material and sex battery? Those are the only charges that we have been made aware of, um, at least for this morning at the latest update that we got at around 1045, um, those charges are still sticking. Uh, Stefan Stearns arrested for child sexual abuse material possession of and then sexual battery as well. Um, so I did speak with a law enforcement expert last night just following the news that he had been arrested and named crime suspect in Maddie's disappearance. And he took a look at that perp walk video and saw that he was wearing that suit that you mentioned, the Tyvek suit. And so he told me that that indicates that um, Stefan Stern's clothing would likely have been seized and processed for genetic and trace evidence. He also likely probably had his hands swabbed and scrapings may have been taken from underneath his fingernails. So I guess that is just the process where law enforcement is right now trying to connect Stefan Stearns with the disappearance of Maddie Soto and better yet, try to find where Maddie Soto is right now. Dr. Trey Sargent joining us, search recovery, search rescue and recovery expert, canine expert and law enforcement. Uh, you're an expert in predator behavior. Why is he wearing the white suit I mentioned that Hannah McKenzie elaborated upon? Yes, Nancy, uh, that is standard protocols to collect any evidence, which is um, includes clothing, uh, body fluids, hair, saliva, anything and everything, and time is of the essence. When we talk about, again, the timeline, we're behind the curve on this, unfortunately, and trying to catch up, so to speak and get evidence before it's destroyed or manipulated in any way. So getting that up front and as close as possible and really covering all the bases, checking all the boxes, because um, everything is pointing to him. And no matter, as you know, as a prosecutor, we may think that this person is the perpetrator and he's a predator and all of these things, but we have to prove it. And in order to prove that, we have to have the evidence. Joining me is Dr. Jory L. Crozen, a psychologist, former law enforcement, now faculty at St. Leo University at drjory.com. Dr. Jory, thank you for being with us. Um, people may say, how could the mom not know that there was a sex predator in her home, uh, that she was allowing access to her child? But... I see it happen all the times, and I believe the mother. I don't think she had any idea what was going on. I don't, from what I can tell, Hannah McKenzie, jump in if I'm wrong. Uh, Dr. Jordan, I don't think she had any idea what was happening. I could go with that also because, you know, I've, I've had patients in child abuse cases where the mother uh, didn't know what was going on because of the relationship with the live-in or the, the boyfriend, 
being such a convincing type person, I mean, that's all part of their personality. That's part of that show that they play. You know, that's who they are in that grooming process. Uh, it's an art form that's well learned. Uh, one of the points about her making a comment wanting to go live in the woods, uh, you know, I find that really kind of disturbing and interesting. And, you know, we work these with timelines. And I, I, first thing I would want to find out is when did she make that comment and who did she make it to? And I bet, you know, you could correlate possibly the start of any kind of sexual activity or abuse with that, because that's, that's really an escape phrase. You know, I want to get out of here. I want to just go live in the woods. You know, I've never uh, heard that it, term before, an escape phrase. And uh, you're hearing Dr. Jory L. Crosin, and now to an expert on grooming. Uh, Anna Sonoda joining us, you know, and Dr. Jory, jump in if you have a different idea as well as to you, Hannah McKenzie. Guys, we're trying to find a little 13-year-old girl. She just turned 13. She's really, as Anna pointed out earlier, she's still really 12. She just turned 13 a couple of days ago, and she kept saying, when I turn 13, I'm going to leave everything behind. I'm going to go live alone in the woods. Why? What girl says that? Hannah, Anna Sonoda joining us, author of Duck, Duck, Groom, Understanding How a Child Becomes a Target. Very, I, I was thinking you may not recognize what's going on because your boyfriend or your husband is a predator, but would you recognize signs in your child? Or if it's a teen, a teenage girl in this case, would you think, oh, She's just slamming her door and locking her door to her bedroom because she's a teen. She's having mood swings, blah, blah, blah. And I want to circle back to this, Hannah McKenzie. I wonder if they didn't immediately come to the scene because they discounted her as a runaway. Just a thought. But I want to address this, Anna Sonoda, the idea that her behavior was discounted because, oh, she's just a teen. This is the way they, be they behave with mood swings. Yeah, Nancy, you've brought up so many interesting points. And I want to first begin by saying that over 90% of all sexual crimes occurs by somebody who is known and trusted. Stranger danger is a complete fib. And what we need to remember in this case is that the home is the highest risk setting for any child. So if we already have proof of sexual battery by this individual that occurred in her home in Kissimmee, my, my alert bells are already on. One thing I need your audience to remember is that children who live with a single parent are, who is dating are 20 times more likely to be sexually abused than a child who is living with two biological parents. So Maddie is already high risk for a situation involving child sexual abuse. Um, when we're Can you give me that figure again, please? Yes, ma'am. So children who are living at home with a single dating parent are 20 times more likely to be sexually abused than a child who's living at home with two biological parents. Children I would also add to that the, the lethality in that relationship of a live-in is very high. That's a risk factor, too, of not only sexual assault or battery, but the lethality. Let me understand what's happening. Hannah McKenzie joining us. Uh, this idea of her going to, quote, live in the woods was also on her phone. The police found that. How was the mom responding to all of this? Well, Nancy, at first, the family told me that that was taken out of context. Um, they did say that it was a conversation between Maddie and one of her friends, and they had been discussing the state of the world, and they said if World War III comes, that was their plan to get away. But I do think the reason that they wanted to get out in front of that text message, because that's what grabbed all the headlines, right? Immediately, when you hear that, you think, run away. And that's what you brought up, Nancy. I think the family was so fearful that law enforcement and everybody else was just going to cast judgment that this was just a runaway. And they wanted all eyes on Maddie's disappearance because they truly believe she did not run away and she was taken and something nefarious has happened. I'm just curious how much time they wasted, Jarrett Fiorentino, thinking that Maddie was a runaway. Her mother has stated that she has never run away from home before, not once, not ever. 
those are precious moments, as you well know, in the initial stages of the investigation. And although everyone claims they treat a runaway uh, missing child the same as if they believe someone has has been harmed, they don't. I mean, this was a very pressing situation. This was not a child who wandered off into the woods. And that sentiment could have thrown off the early stages of the search for Maddie here. I'm trying to figure out how much time they actually lost. And we know because the school claims they did a robocall to the parents. Um, we've lost several hours. Question, Hannah McKenzie, is the boyfriend now behind bars in custody on sex battery and possession of material related to child sex abuse is he saying anything at all about where maddie may be from this point we don't know if he's cooperating um, with law enforcement the last update that we got from them um, they had mentioned that he had invoked his right to an attorney and was placed under arrest that to me is a red flag saying he is not speaking until he has someone present legally representing him. I understand that grainy video surveillance, which may be the most important clue we've got yet, and I assume that police are combing through his vehicle with a fine-toothed comb right now, but that grainy surveillance, isn't it around 8.50, 8.50 a.m. in the morning and doesn't it last for about 10 minutes? Do you believe that Maddie appears to be sitting in the parking lot as if she's waiting for someone? I'm actually not too sure about the details of that surveillance video taken from the church. Um, Maddie's mom, Jen, told me she wasn't even allowed to see it. She did tell me her sister um, had seen it. And then it seems like law enforcement took a little bit of a back step and said, well, it's very grainy. We haven't even been able to prove without a reasonable doubt that it is Maddie. And that is when he mentioned that there was other video taken from the area as well. Based on that grainy surveillance video that occurred around 8.50 a.m. on the morning of February 26, it appears, according to a family friend, that it is Madeline, and she appears to be sitting there as if she was told to wait like she's waiting on someone. Now, I don't know how much you can glean, how you can determine that from uh, surveillance video, but that's what was stated by a family friend. What more can you tell me about the relationship between the mom and the boyfriend? Well, Nancy, it is interesting that uh, sometimes Stefan Stearns is referred to as boyfriend. Other times he is ex-boyfriend. When I spoke with Maddie's mom, Jen, um, we did that initial interview, um, and it was via Zoom. Um, the entire time, Stefan Stearns is in the background. He's sitting just behind Jen, and he makes his appearance known. He comes in during the interview, drops a chair quite loudly, and then sits just behind Jen, staring into the camera, popping his knuckles, audibly cracking his hands, and fidgeting the entire time she's talking to me. Okay, I'm not certainly not an expert in uh, non-verbal messages, but Jarrett Fiorentino, you and I have tried enough cases to know what that means. It's intimidating, it's defensive, it's a power play. Like, I mean, do you see my husband running across the back of this uh, screen behind me? No, because it has nothing to do with him. Uh, is he back there flexing his muckle, muscles and cracking his knuckles? N no. Just, I find that really bizarre. It, it is bizarre, and that's not the way, whatever his intention was with that behavior, it's certainly not consistent with someone who, number one, was the last person to see this child before she went missing, and number two, someone who's concerned and wants to utilize the media to get the message out. It's somebody who, at a minimum, is trying to be intimidating, or it's just acting strange, not in keeping with someone who's concerned. And, and, and Jared, let's just clear something up. He can have a lawyer tell him, exercise your Fifth Amendment. After speaking to him, say, take the Fifth, don't talk. 
he doesn't have to talk about his child sex materials claim or his sex battery claim, but if he wants to find Maddie, he could talk about that and waive uh, his right to remain silent on that issue alone, couldn't he? He certainly can, and it looks like the police gave him the opportunity to do just that, and they said he denied them the opportunity to bring closure and find Maddie. That statement has come out, so it appears that they've even given him that narrow road to say, help us find her, clear up this disappearance, and he's invoked his right to counsel. And, and you know as well as I do, uh, no one's going to advise that he come in and come clean. Hannah McKenzie, I I'm not sure about this, but I'm getting the idea that what you're telling me or what this means is that there is surveillance video from other cameras, business or residential, that suggests that was not Maddie in the parking lot? Well, it's unclear because initially family had said there was video of Maddie taken from surveillance video from the church near where she was dropped off. The sheriff's office came back after and said, well, it's very grainy and we haven't for sure ruled out that that is her or not. But he did also mention, Sheriff Mina also mentioned in his press uh, conference that there was other video taken from the area. And I think that's just standard protocol when it comes into play. I mean, they're going to go to every business, every camera that they can find in that vicinity. To, I understand to try and that, but my point is, jumping ahead, does the other video from the area corroborate that she was ever in the boyfriend's vehicle, that he ever dropped her off, or did they just keep going? Is that why the dogs aren't picking up a scent? Because I trust the bloodhounds. If they're not picking up a scent, then there's something wrong with the story. What is wrong with the story? I, I don't know. Does that video suggest that was another girl in the parking lot? I agree with you. And, and I can only tell. Oh. Chris Nancy, McDonough, is that you jump in? Because, yes, ma'am. That, that's a great point because that, that would be the pivotal moment that the electronic shift would have occurred in terms of the investigation. If, in fact, they have the video and they're not seeing, you know, Matt, the, the young lady sitting, then if they see the car go by, immediately they're going to start looking for that digital footprint. And, and that's probably they downloaded it into in a program called Celebrite, and you can get pictures and everything uh, almost immediately. And that's probably what turned their head towards this guy and said, Which hey, wait a minute. reminds me, I'm glad you said that. Hannah McKenzie, what's the make and model of his car? I'm not for sure. I was told by Maddie's aunt that it was an older model Buick. That's what she believes it to be. The reason I'm disappointed is because if it were a, a, a more recent version, I would know that there was a nav, uh, navigational um, equipment in the car. So there would be a way for that car to be tracked. That said, if he kept a cell phone with him, which I predict that he did, we would be able to ping and track that cell phone to find out where he had been in that vehicle. The car is being processed to find out if Maddie was harmed in that vehicle. Is somebody jumping in? If so, do it now. Nancy, it's Jarrett. Uh, absolutely. That's going to be a huge piece. His comings and goings, you know the police have his phone. That's where they found the child abuse materials. So they're going to be able to trace Number one, if he did, in fact, drop Maddie off or where in any of the surrounding areas he may have gone with her or taken her, could have left her, uh, her body, God forbid. But that's really going to be where the investigation is at right now. If you know or think you know anything about the disappearance of this 13-year-old little girl, Maddie Soto, please call 407-254-7000. We are waiting for the make and model of the boyfriend's car, but please think back. Were you in the area? Do you know anything? Does your son or daughter know anything that Maddie may have said? 407-254-7000. We wait as justice unfolds. Goodbye.
Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.